Hello, you're listening to Copy Time, a podcast series on markets and economies from DBS Group Research. I'm Taimur Beg, Chief Economist. Welcome you to our 48th episode. I recently came across a terrific organization called the Global Institute for Tomorrow, GIFT, an independent pan-Asian think tank. Its founder and CEO is Chandra Nair, who is the author of the book The Sustainable State, a really good read on thinking about the future of government, society, and economy. It led to my reading Chandran's provocative and thought-provoking recent article, The Great Reset, on the global vulnerabilities that need to be tackled urgently. After that, I knew that I had to have Chandran on this podcast. So here we go. Chandran Nair, welcome to Kobe Time. Thank you. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Oh, I've been looking forward to having you. So, Chandran, I will start by talking a bit about this article you wrote recently called The Great Reset. And uh, there are quite a few sort of provocative assertions and arguments, and I find them fascinating, and I hope that we can go through some of them there. Uh, so let's start with the one where you said that, you know, the pandemic has highlighted the need to challenge our assumptions and understanding. Uh, it's a big subject, but if you could talk about a couple of the myths and fallacies that you think have been exposed quite brutally by the events of last year? Well, I think I'll, let me just name three, um, uh, Temo. Uh, the first one is this idea that markets uh, will essentially solve problems and that the private enterprise and private sector can essentially step in and uh, uh, help find solutions to things. Uh, what's become very clear in it that we're clear through the COVID is the indispensable role of the state. Uh, so I think that has, for me, been a, a learning uh, for the world. Um, that's clearly also that I mean that was something that I argued in my book, the Sustainable State, which came by year, came out a year before, and which uh, got a lot of the you know normal commentators who review books kind of a bit freaked out because I started with a chapter about China. And uh, anyone who says anything good about China these days is uh, should be censored. Uh, so, uh, so the book didn't get uh, that uh, uptake from the usual channels. But um, you know, but the COVID uh, it got the book a fair bit of attention because it reinforced the argument I was making that in the 21st century, well, we're so uh, going to be um, uh, challenged with existential threats like climate pandemics. A population uh, peaking, um, the, what I call the overreach of technology, etc. We're going to have to have rules, and the rules are not made by the stock market, nor the actors in the stock market. It's not going to be made by Apple, uh, you know, Tomasek or um, or Boeing. It's going to be made by the institutions of our communities, which is essentially the state. And in the absence of that, we get chaos. And the pandemics told us one. And I think it's been a big wake-up call for the Western world. But there has been this, I think, uh, uh, and highly, um, you know, it's it's it's, it's long overdue um, exposure to the, the the lie that you can have essentially sort of some sort of uh, democratic utopia in which you know grassroots and societies just function. Uh, and then every four years you go and elect a leader, but things all work out. Uh, and I think it's very, it's become very clear that uh, strong, that liberal Western democracies have struggled uh, because of the inability for the state to act. And uh, the best example is the United States, where on one hand, people talk about the, the US president as being the most powerful man in the world. He can't even get his citizens to wear a mask. That's how toothless he is. So the state, the, and the state, I argue, is a much more complex thing than just institutions, et cetera. So that's one myth. The other myth is that the market will solve, solve problems. It can't. The third one that I've also talked about, and in fact, I did a, I did a panel discussion with UCLA, uh, I think about four or five months ago, where it was about the lessons that we can learn. I think I said one of the clear lessons we've learned is that technology is not a panacea. And the pan is the, the the most important technology uh, for essentially curbing the or, or not curbing but at least um, helping us cope was not an advanced bit of technology. It was called it was essentially something that you put across your face, uh, across your nose, uh, nasal passage in your mouth. It's called a mask, and that, that simple thing. 
But very importantly, it required also societies to conform, which comes back to our rules, etc. The last thing I think uh, I would say that this is exposed is also the vulnerability of um, uh, you know globalized systems that have been over glorified for far too long. And one of the things I've been talking about is there's two things developing countries in particular need to be cognizant of, of from the pandemic is the real importance of food security. And therefore, but dependent, but, but based on self-sufficiency as much as you can. So food self-sufficiency, grow your own food. Uh, much of Southeast Asia, you know, as you know, uh, people eat three meals of rice a day in some in the Philippines, Indonesia, etc. And many of these countries are essentially not self-sufficient. The Philippines used to grow its own rice, it can't now. So Malaysia should be growing all its own rice, all its own vegetables, right? But we got into this whole realm of globalization, et cetera, supply chains, and people outsourced their security and their food sufficiency to essentially complex supply chains that, that essentially crumbled. And part of the next part is the whole health systems. Again, I'm a firm believer. I was speaking at the... At a, at I was doing an address yesterday to the the Global Alliance for Banking for Values. Uh, and I was saying that, you know, it, it, those banks that are signed up to this high this high principled agenda should be focusing on investing in healthcare. Healthcare both at the, the preventative side and on the preventative side is imagine a world in Southeast Asia in 25 years where every household will have portable water and every drop of water will be treated. Because if you come from a science and engineering and environmental engineering background, in an over-sanitized world, without sanitation, we are going to create a huge amount of problems about this. And uh, again, in the midst of the crisis, I wrote a paper that was well, not a paper, an article called The, the High Cost of Over-Sanitized World. At the moment, uh, in most, I come from an engineering, bioengineering background. Uh, most of us don't know that at least 80% of all wastewater is probably not treated to the standards in Singapore or in Hong Kong. That creates a huge amount of risk. And that's where we need to be investing. So I think it's exposed all of these things that we didn't really understand. And I'm hoping that this will get set, allow governments to understand where their priorities need to be um, with smaller places like Singapore, wealthy, Hong Kong, wealthy, have been able to, to attend to. But as you know better than I do, that the world is actually made up of large countries, uh, your home country, Bangladesh, et cetera, large populations to which we're going to be adding in the next, uh, in around the world over the next uh, 30 years, 2.5 billion people. So that's for me the, the reality check we need to we need to confront. So, and, and no, that's absolutely, Chandran. Yeah. I mean, we have been so fixated with airborne diseases for the last year or so, but the waterborne diseases can present even greater challenges uh, and create even greater catastrophes around the world. Um, one other myth that I've seen you write about, and I think it's related to the issue of markets not being a panacea, is the what we, you have written as a myth of corporate resiliency. Um, now, we see these all-powerful corporations around the world with billions of dollars of revenue and massive cash cushion. And it seems to me that there's this one narrative is that they are actually winners under all circumstances, uh, that they capture regulation, they capture government interest, and they survive even if governments don't. So what do you mean by this myth of corporate resiliency? Well, the, the myth of corporate resilience, let's take the most basic one, uh, you know, um, Three months into um, into the pandemic, and companies that had boasted, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of business, or billions of dollars of profits sustained over a decade, could not pay wages. Uh, you and I would not run our family budgets that way. We would have enough in the kitty that come a rainy day, you know, if I get hit by a bus or I'm unemployed and sacked, um, I have still got reserves. I think it's called savings, uh, to take care of those I'm responsible for. And uh, all around the world, the large, some of the largest companies uh, needed bailouts or needed somehow the government to pump money into the system 
which, as you know, much better than I do the mechanics of, essentially landed in financial markets, enriching stock markets, etc. Uh, companies that have been making profits for so long. And I think this must change. And I, I believe this is the intervention that is absolutely needed. Uh, governments have to ensure that companies uh, uh, preserve enough capital and reserve and cash to be able to pay off uh, and sustain hardship, not for 25 years, but at least 12 months, right? Uh, I mean, I'm just taking the example of Cathay Pacific in Hong Kong, which is my my favorite airline. And within three months, uh, hundreds of people were fired, thousands of people were fired. Some of them friends of mine, you know, people who'd worked for the company for 15, 20 years, uh, the airline crew, because like you, I fly almost every week and I used to go there. But I knew. And uh, so I think that the, that they, they must have a protection. And I think, as you know, after the financial crisis, uh, I, I think it's called the Basel Agreement is something that essentially required banks to have in our reserves so that, that they didn't, if they took risk, those risks didn't undermine the whole financial system. Something similar needs to happen. So the idea that comp corporations are resilient uh, is a myth because the, the whole sort of extraction of wealth without any risk mitigation in terms of protecting the wider pool of stakeholders, including employees, is not built into this uh, so-called resilience. And that I think is, is, is so important. Uh, and, uh, and companies need to be uh, you know, uh, checked on that. And I can go into other areas, but the resilience side is, uh, we, the government should not be then having to bail them out and bailing them out is, you know, uh, taxpayers' dollars again. Right. So if we have needed and, two and large scale... where does all that money go, you know? Go ahead, sorry. Yes, no, absolutely. So, I mean, if we have needed two large-scale bailouts in just 12 years between the GFC and this COVID crisis, then clearly, you know, the, the resiliency part is probably overstated. Um, Chandra, of course, related to the bailout is the role of the public sector. So we've had record fiscal and monetary stimulus measures in the past year. and uh, but like, look at the narrative in Washington DC right now. The moment Joe Biden became president and started talking about his $1.9 trillion stimulus package, we found fiscal conservatives appearing out of the woodworks and everybody's now worried about uh, the debt issue, the deficit issue, and even the little tremor that we have seen in interest rate markets in the last month or so is serving as a confirmation of that fear that the public sector is spending too much and perhaps not in a very efficient manner. Um, so what's your sense? Would the legacy of the COVID crisis be a fundamental rethink about the purse strings of the governments, that it will be a little more largest oriented and therefore things like green energy, universal basic income, things which have not been funded because of this whole who will pay for it complaint, that it will not be as loud going forward? Yeah, I mean, in that article and uh, the whole piece is much longer. It's actually 11,000 word uh, article, which I, I'm hoping that I can get someone to to post. Uh, but I, I, the second idea I talked about is rethinking monetary policy for public good. And uh, the element you touched upon is clearly one element. But that discussion that is taking place in the United States, in my view, is still stuck in a view about government spending and who pays for it within the sort of neoliberal uh, uh, framework of monetary policy. And I, I will be the first to not claim to be an expert on monetary policy, et cetera. But I did, when I was writing this, uh, you know, think hopefully slightly intelligently, well, what is money and what is it used for? And what do we organize our economies for? And in that process, in writing this particular thing, given that the example you gave, governments had to spend a lot of money, you know, you will know that you know the United States has uh, has um, uh, exorbitant privilege of printing money. The more money they print, the more the debt that we carry, uh, or the rest of the world. Um, so that's that's slightly different. But if the United States was a, just another country without an exorbitant privilege, like other other countries, what would that mean? Uh, and I, I talked to a fair amount of people 
uh, both uh, central central bank governors and a couple of other people. And you know, uh, there is no problem, in my understanding, in printing money. The question is, what is it backed up by? The, that's the who pays for what? What is the value? What is the asset uh, that backs up that spending of, of money? And I, 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 I believe that um, if you look at the, the sort of financial systems, et cetera, and the way we operate the, 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 the financial systems today, financial markets, then those arguments that you talked about, about the fiscal prudence, school of thought against to the, those who are against uh, auster- uh, pro-spending, uh, et cetera, come into play. But if we looked at things in a different way, then I think we begin to understand that the way we govern our societies, the economy, which is it's not a finance, it's not about financial markets. Uh, we we talk in our research that the economy is not about financial markets. The economy is essentially the way we organize our societies, so that we create societies in which uh, people have a way to live that allows them to escape the drudgery of life and allows them to have meaningful work. We don't organize our economies on the basis of how many billionaires can we create, how much wealth can we create that is uh, essentially even based on underpricing and extracting uh, extracting resources, uh, uh, et cetera, without thinking about tomorrow. So I think that, and as the, as we have seen, there's a huge disconnect at the moment between stock market and the real economy. So what I think will have, what needs to happen is we need to really rethink this whole issue about public spending. And in, so then coming to your question about climate, uh, about um, healthcare, et cetera, that has to be the, the, the purview of the state. I don't think it'd be outsourced to the market. It can, some of it can be uh, um, markets responding, but the state creating the parameters of where we're wanting to spend. And then, of course, we have to essentially put a price to climate change abatement that allows for us to print that money. And the best example I have to moving away from climate change is, uh, for instance, uh, people talk about where would the jobs come from, how would be paid for. Uh, it would be something like cleaning a river, because water has uh, has a price, but we don't price water properly, and we don't put it on the balance sheet of the country, right? But water is is so important going forward. So if the state printed money, I'm, I'm going to take Malaysia as an example, and printed money that created 100,000 jobs, uh, to essentially monitor, protect, clean, and preserve all the freshwater wa- water systems and get them from 80% polluted to essentially, you know, uh, 80% unpolluted. That would be, a say, a 30-year th- project, right? The state would then be able to essentially, I believe, print money, create those jobs, et cetera, if needed, uh, some of it that would come back to the normal economy, but the pain for it is backed by essentially the asset, which is 80% fresh water supplies have been protected. And the same with reforestation, vegetation, etc. In a way, that's how the Chinese government operates. They print a lot of money to do these sorts of things. So I'm hoping, uh, and I'm no expert, but that the ability of the state, and clearly it has to be responsible, to spend money to pro- protect public and common goods will be essentially backed up by the value of those assets, the public good assets that the state has pro- pro- protected, provided money for, rather than printing money within the current neoliberal economic system, which eventually, and I'm not speaking as some lefty, lands up in uh, financial markets through the same some channels, which has created all the sort of mistrust about how markets are stacked against the rich and the poor and all of that. So that, but uh, just to finish off that thing, well, there's a huge body of work that's going on around this, uh, which you were working, but it's not in the mainstream. And I think uh, our job is to bring it into the mainstream. And at GIFT, we just started doing some leadership programs in with the central bank here in Malaysia to say, what do you do? Or how can we get the central bank to start putting a value to natural capital 
in ways that that will allow the financial institutions of the country to back those things up and steer away from any lending, et cetera, investments that essentially depreciate national capital. There's a whole a ton of work to be done. And you know, just last week I heard Singh Tamasic has now said um, uh, climate change, the new CEO, is a, is a chairman of CEO, I think he was coming. So he said uh, climate change is going to be the number one priority. And three months ago, I believe the Singapore government said we're going to reduce their food um, uh, dependency by 30, uh, yeah, by 30% or something like that, right? I've been trying to say this to the Hong Kong government. And then you can print money to create that because the asset the assets backing that up, you know, and the social asset value increases. We have to find new ways to essentially, uh, I suppose, um, uh, back uh, monetize that in the ways that it could on the national balance sheet. I hope I'm making sense to the banker. No, absolutely. So, children, I mean, for me, what you say does not sound heretical at all, because at the end of the day, as far as I'm concerned, you're talking about better pricing or the true pricing of assets that yes. we just don't value right now. And that is fully within the framework of conventional economic analysis. We just have been negligent of not pricing it correctly. And in your book, Sustainable State, you talk about this true cost accounting of wide range of businesses, where if you can take on all the negative externalities, those businesses should not be operating. Uh, to me, that is basically getting capitalism right, not like you know reinventing capitalism to some extent. And I suppose even the area of efficiency of its spending or the quality of spending. I think, you know, right. uh, it is not something that would be shocking for somebody sitting in Washington, D.C. in the IMF or the World Bank either. So they have been advocating maybe not loud enough and not effectively enough, but they've also been talking about, you know, there's a quantity of spending and a quality of spending. And when you are spending on green initiatives, on sustainable jobs, how can anybody question the quality of that spending? So your, your t points are very well taken. But that immediately takes me to this other issue, um, which is, you know, I think in the literature, people talk about it as a degrowth policy that, you know, we simply cannot continue with the current paradigm of growth, which is largely around material consumption of ever increasing order. And if India and China's per capita consumption were to reach the level of the US, there would be nothing left in this world. So I take it reading your writings that you know you are part of that group. I think you believe in what you call reimagining growth. So walk us through that a little bit. Right. So let me, I mean, as you said, you framed it very well. The, you know, for anyone listening, the simple law of physics is that if uh, six billion Asians in 2050 which is what the population in Asia will be consumed, like the average European or, or American, basically game over. So this is not ideology. This is just basically the laws of entropy and, uh, and the scientific data. Then the question, though, is, well, but as I said earlier, we need economies, uh, and I don't mean e economies in the traditional sense of you know, traditional economic theories, but we need to economies that allow societies to essentially escape the drudgery of the human condition if not provided with the basic amenities, right? And in my view, uh, and uh, these would be essentially uh, um, in the 21st century, would be food, uh, safe and secure. The safe and secure is a book in itself, but you know, uh, don't have time to go into this. That's a very complex uh, uh, interrelationship in many ways between land use, uh, the way we use technology, water, uh, healthcare, all that. But uh, then there is basically water and sanitation. I think the water and sanitation aspect is so poorly understood that it shocks me. And when I talked earlier about water and sanitation, I was also uh, because we are worrying about air, air in terms of the virus and droplets, but we are also telling everyone wash your hands and this and that. And what are we using? We are using a whole load of chemicals to wash. Even people with bad proper toilets are using a ton of chemicals. Guess where all of that goes? And then we're spraying everything at the moment in the hope of killing every bug. Guess where all of that goes? That basically goes in the waterway. So water and sanitation is going to be very important. Then I call I talk about minimum energy use. We people need that. Uh, you know, I forget the numbers, but you know, today in India, and I think if you include Bangladesh, something like half a billion people 
do not have access to a stable electricity supply. They have that right. For me, that's a human right. We're not talking about air conditioning, but a bulb so that kids can study, et cetera. So that's what. Then there's the issue of housing. Uh, and we're not talking about condominiums and glasses and you know CVs. We're talking about basic study homes that give people the dignity to essentially live. For women, the security of uh, being able to stay at home, and there's uh, of course also this uh, the, the the toilets and all are built into that. So the, the home bit comes into all of that in a way. And we're not talking about luxury, but we certainly need to remove people from the abysmal conditions. So many in here of the human uh, race live in, all right? And then lastly is uh, uh, education. So, so when, I, when we talk about uh, those, that's what a society needs to do, that's what a society needs to provide. So I, I think rather than just talk about, uh, so what we need to abandon in short, uh, Timo, is this whole archaic view that the only way you rise, po you get populations out of poverty and improve quality of life, is through trickle-down economics, that you grow the pie larger and larger and somehow it trickles down. The only problem is the gravy is too thick. And in making the gravy, uh, we essentially create a lot of ripples that have now come to roots. People cannot essentially have that. So call it what you may, I, I, I'm not a big fan of using words like degrowth, etc because people get the idea that you're against progress. I would just try to call it, um, the metric should be, what are the development metrics? How many people have a toilet, right? And I'm not talking the toilet, the, the Toto from Japan, right? How many people have a home that give them dignity? How many people have that? And that then relates back to monetary policy. The trickle down economic idea that somehow there needs to be a global economy in which uh, there is FDI, and if Walmart comes to Bangladesh, uh, it would create 10,000 jobs, and let's now fight for another foreign direct investment. I don't think that's, that, uh, that, that will answer the questions I just raised. Indians will have to wait 500 years before they are homes. So strong intervention, uh, rupees to essentially create uh, uh, bonds for low-cost housing, the best technology in the world, material science, et cetera, to build steady homes that essentially last 50 years against monsoon. We have all of this technology. And then financial systems, financial institutions that essentially allow for people to procure these houses backed by the state, et cetera. So a complete sort of rethink. So um, I, I, I don't like degrowth, but what I do know is our current definition of growth, which is what you talked about, is essentially one premised on consumption, overconsumption. And um, my first book was essentially about consumption. And um, the idea that uh, our, uh, but our consumption model is simply not sustainable because it relies on driving relentless consumption by underpricing resources and externalizing the costs. And these two things have essentially, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to be a greenie or anything to understand, cannot carry on. And the pandemic, I hope, has given us all a wake up call. The human beings have essentially, through the growth model, disrespected all the limitations and boundaries of where human beings need to be constrained uh, to be able to flourish without thinking about growth through relentless consumption. And that's, this is not a philosophical debate about whether someone should have two cars, or whether you should have a Ferrari. This is simply about, there is not enough to go around. So how do we do that? And that I think is the obligation of the state uh, and to do it in ways with economic models that allow for, for that. So I don't know if I've answered your question, but I'm, I don't like the word degrowth. I think we grow for what? We grow to develop societies and we develop societies against certain fundamental human rights. And those human rights for me are those things I mentioned. Right, and I think in some ways, the sustainable development goals that were set down by the UN go towards the metrics that you're talking about, that you know, I mean, how many people have you lifted out of poverty? How many people have a minimum amount of income and access to clean water, sanitation and so on? But Chandra, even as recently as last year, I spoke with um, activists in the United States whose focus was about 
clean energy, but not cons conservation, whose focus was on the next electric vehicle coming so that everybody can still have two cars, but two EVs, but not that you know one car could be enough if you had a decent public infrastructure. So, and related to that is this almost like mythic magical belief that technology will save the day, that we will harvest clean energy from the sun and hydrogen and we can drive as much as we want. So why isn't this notion that you're talking about, and I fully concur with you, that the patterns of consumption in the West is simply not replicable in the East, especially with China and India rising, but it's not catching on, not in the West, not in the East. Well, the, the reason is, uh, I've, I've argued this in my first book, um, the, uh, and this is also political. The, 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 if you've been brought up in an advanced economy, uh, and even if you're a young person, and the car is part and parcel of how the world operates. We don't know any better. I always tell people that uh, those of us who are privileged enough, we think the flush toilet came with Jesus Christ or Muhammad or something, whatever religion, but it didn't, right? So those of us who don't know this have no idea. So when I've seen, I've taken people who just used to that first world experience, and taking them to China or India or places where there are no toilets, they completely freak out because they have, can't imagine this. So you're, you've hit on something which is very important, which is in the Western world, um, where people have had so much, the answer to every problem is technology because to go into the other area of the discussion, which is restraint, which is you can't have, is impossible to imagine. So the COVID has, for the rest of us, and that's and that why I feel, you know, uh, made clear the argument in my book. In the Western world, the ability to sacrifice is not possible, even amongst liberals, because the notion is we are free souls. We do what we can. And it's so deeply rooted that it's the, uh, the idea that I have to sacrifice something is impossible. So to, uh, to tell people that they can't have what they get, they had, is impossible. Therefore, you take the you know you take the the panacea, the, the the therapy, which is technology will solve the problem, without understanding that even if you extract more energy from sustainable sources, you use it for something else. That energy itself, your ability to use it, creates other externalities. Right? People don't understand. So I'm always very uh, you know. Um, disappointed by even so-called experts I know who just think renewable energy is the solution. No, it's what we use that energy for. If we continue along the extractive mode, we'll destroy everything. So I think my point is, in the Western world, it's very difficult because of the sense of entitlement and privilege over a long time. Um, my third book is actually talking about that too. It's called um, uh, Dismantling Global White Privilege and equity for a post-Western world. Uh, it sounds controversial, but it's, uh, it's more, um, it's, it's saying some very inconvenient truths, right? But it's very difficult for people to answer that. Now, the opportunity in the developing countries is, is something that I want, I'm urging developing countries to take advantage of. The majority of people don't have. Now, but if you tell them they can have everything, then you're essentially creating a catastrophe, right? You know, I give the example. If, uh, if, um, if half a billion Chinese ate fish, uh, amounts of fish that the average Australian eats, the oceans will be empty. But who is to say that the Australians have a right to eat fish, but the Chinese don't, right? So it's a numbers issue. And therefore, the states have to intervene. So in Asia and Africa, we will have to essentially reshape the expectations of the society. And that expectation, I call reframing rights and freedoms. The, the, the understanding of freedom in the West is unfettered. So if, when I go to the United States and I've spoken, especially in my first book, and I say that car ownership is not a human right, they think I'm undercover Taliban. I shaved and took my turban off at the airport. They don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or oh, I'm I, I maybe some uh, rebel from Xinjiang or something, you know. Uh, but they don't understand that that is a reality. Uh, in our part of the world, and Singapore is a good example, 
is already putting essentially using economic instruments to essentially curb car ownership, but at the same time, strong public policy to provide alternatives. That's what the future looks like. But car ownership is not a human right. And in most of our countries, I would say, we need more cars in our streets and cities, like I need a hole in my head. But the Western concept is, hey, there'll be a green car. Right, go on. Uh, you know, imagine that fantasy in Mumbai or Dhaka. Right. So these things are really uh, fantastic. So we have a real ideological difference and cultural difference. And the COVID has really shown it through the simple inability of people to conform to simple rules. And I'm in Malaysia, which is not the most advanced and disciplined of countries, as average Singaporean will know. But um, even here, people understand collective interests. Right. Hong Kong is extreme. China is extreme. They all understand the rules, Koreans, Japanese, but even here in Malaysia. And so we look at the United States or the UK and say, my God, Westerners have no understanding of collective and freedom is unfettered and my rights can never be essentially dictated to me. And that's the point you're making. That I'm so the, pan the, the easy to go to is technology. I'll have an app and it will solve all my problems. But it will not solve our water problem. It will not solve our food problem. It will not solve our housing problem. It will not solve our energy problems. It can be part of the solution. But you're going to have to have draconian measures that are based on reshaping expectations. I can go on about this for energy levels. You know, we can use technology to regulate. We you know you can use technology to start pricing. So I, I say an example, Singapore is going to be serious about climate change. Very good, right? So Singaporeans can start, Singapore using technology, the most advanced technology, can start to essentially price every bedroom in Singapore where someone with privilege and wealth essentially turns the air conditioning down to 20 degrees C to get a good night's sleep. Well, you can, but my God, we're going to charge you by the hour. And then we see different homes, different things. I have... You know, I have people I know in Singapore who sleep at 90 degrees C. What privilege. But you can't talk about carbon by allowing people to do that. Then we said, say, okay, you can have that, but we're going to charge you. That privilege comes with a cost. Similarly with water. People take, you know, people have bath tubs. Really? Uh, people take showers. We can, we can monitor your shower. You know, people talk about the Internet of Things. Well, we can monitor your shower. Three minutes shower, beyond three minutes, we'll charge you. So that's where we use technology. But technology is not going to solve the problem of not enough water, bad food supply systems, energy things that are systems that are not working. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't think the West gets it. And I think the last point I make, I'm sorry I'm going on, but um, the democratic systems have essentially corrupted people into thinking, no one should get into my space. The reality in a crowded world, in Asia, Africa, we're going to have to live collectively. Democratic systems do not sit comfortably with the sustainability challenge of the 21st century. I'm a member of the Club of Rome, and um, you know I have great difficulties expressing to my esteemed uh, colleagues who all, uh, you know, much more uh, well uh, technically and educated than me that their view of the world is skewed towards what is possible within liberal demo democracies. And there's a lot that's not possible given the constraints that we will have to deal with in the crowded parts of the world. Well, one of the big challenges that you talk rather provocatively about is what you call this need for managed retreat from nature. Um, so do you not want us to go to parks and forests? Do you want us to leave forests untouched forever? Uh, what exactly are you talking about in this context? Well, a managed retreat from nature doesn't mean we shouldn't go to parks. Parks are already uh, things that human beings have intruded on, right? So, uh, and that should, that should be, we should be able to enjoy nature. But a managed retreat from nature, by that I mean, Intrusions that create irreversible change and damage, right? So there are certainly certain parts of the world that, uh, and particularly with industrial scale interventions. So you, you know, I, I spoke at the World Summit on 
tourism and trade, tourism and tourism uh, two years ago, 2019, in, uh, it was in Spain. And uh, one of the keynote speakers was actually a former President Obama. And I was, I think, the second and third speaker after him. And I, But no one actually wanted to, and everyone was saying, tourism has got to be eco and this and that. But no one actually wanted to talk about the need to curb the excessive tourism, which is leaving a footprint on every corner of the world. What do we care about? So, so I talked about the water example. You know, I talked about food wastage. I said, why don't hotels not have buffets? Get rid of them. I don't need to get up at nine, eight in the morning on a business trip and have 25 different you know, options. I need three options and charge me double. Why you change the whole economic idea? I don't need a bathtub. Take all the bathtubs out and charge me for my shower if I exceed three minutes. All those things. But when you talk about you know uh, uh, tourism and green and wilderness, then it's come you know eco tourism. Well, that's no such thing. You can be slightly light, but we live in a world in which we're going to completely need to protect some areas, no go zones, both in the oceans and terrestrial. So yes, go to parks, etc. But certain areas are too precious. We're going to have to make to uh, have them very restricted to human intervention. I'll give you one example. In a way, you know, California, uh, California is going to become one of the hottest parts of the world, as you know. The fires are going to be some of the most ex- intensive for the next 50 years. I've been saying for many years, that, you know, because always people think about this and they think of some way in uh, Brazil or you know in the tropics virgin forests, et cetera. But nature is all over. And uh, I mean, I, to give an example, I said, with the forest fires, the US government is going to have to restrict people from intruding on that beautiful mm. natural landscape. Because once they go in, they take all the other stuff and therefore increases the risk of fire. That's what's happened, right? Rich people said, hey, I'm gonna have another holiday home in that lonely place away from everybody else. They build that road and then 10 of their friends come. And before you know it, there's a little enclave there and it's increased all the fire risk. That's human intervention into nature, natural space, nature. So governments need to get in there and say no more. But last year, I, began, I heard that the California government is already thinking about that. So parks, of course, but managed and a proper pay for it. Now, that, of course, does leave us open to the charge that only the rich will be able to visit. But there are many ways to kind of, kind of look at these things in different ways. But my main point was we have to essentially say there are no-go zones. No, we can't just continue to in, in, uh, intrude all the time in the name of development. Chandran, you began this conversation by saying that uh, if you talk constructively about China, people already look at you with suspicion, but I'm going to put you in that corner anyway. Um, Without sort of China's active participation on the climate change agenda, we basically have no hope. I mean, they're so large and their footprint is so big. Are they serious and are they really walking the talk on sustainability? Oh, um, you know, so I I, I go back to this uh, a long time. So I remember 25 years ago speaking to the to, to who uh, the person who was until a few years ago China's chief negotiator on climate change. He was that time the director of the environmental agency, uh, Xie Shenhua. And I have absolutely no doubt that the Chinese are very serious. Now, 25 years ago, and then that's also a very interesting either you know thing about uh, misrepresentation that uh, because people can't read Chinese, uh, the Chinese statements, they think the Chinese don't care. I think this is extremely arrogant and almost xenophobic, in particularly in the Western media. So 25 years ago, the Chinese view was a bit more like India, um, while these Western countries are now trying to curb our growth by suggesting that we need to put all these measures in play, place reduce our per capita carbon emissions, et cetera. That changed dramatically 10 years ago. They said, my God, if we don't do this, we go down too, right? Then the question was, how do you tame the beast? There's on one hand, the other beast of pursuing economic growth, 
uh, a country that was so poor. And they opened that up, signed up to the WTO. And for the first time, hundreds of millions of Chinese began to see uh, the benefits of a more liberalized economy and the benefits of globalization. How do you tame that? That's going to be difficult. But at the same time, they realize if they don't do something, it is going to be catastrophic. So uh, my view is China is extremely serious. And anyone who's in the game understands that uh, in the data, uh, China is taking incredibly important steps with this regard. Now, one thing I, I, the point I make is to do all of this, you need what I call the ability to make policy quickly, right? And you need to have long-term visions. The Chinese uh, system, you know, leave aside whether you agree with what you want to call it, but the Chinese system is able to essentially make 25-year plans, see them through, and mobilize the entire resources of the country to focus on an agenda. Democratic systems are unable to do that. And so closer to home, uh, is India is going to be one of the most vulnerable. India is going to have a larger population than China in 30 years. Can India's democratic system do this? I very much doubt it. So therein lies the other very difficult conundrum we have. So to your question, China is absolutely committed, in my view. Will it be easy? No, because the economic beast is also was unleashed at the same time. They're going to have to bring it all down. Do they have the tools? Yes, because they do have a different culture, civilizational attitude, and they do have the tools, which in the West is seen as oppressive. In the Chinese system, it's seen as putting collective interests ahead of individual rights and making sacrifices. So, you know, you're not putting me in the spot. I, I talk about it very much. It's very much part of my argument. But because I mentioned China as an example, People get all hot under the collar. But in a way, Singapore has done that too. You know, I remember the Singapore. Singapore basically is a, a, a state that is able to bring its citizens along with long term visions. It's able to say, hey, we need to do this. So when I look at Singapore's vision, like, you know, I'm in Hong Kong, the much of the turmoil of the last uh, year or so has been about the disenfranchisement of young people although it's been couched in other terms and people have used political unease as part of the vehicle, et cetera. But the basic problem is essentially uh, a capitalist system in, Singers, in Hong Kong, which is designed and operated by the Brits, that essentially commoditized land and privatized it, which did not, does, does, not, does not allow young people now to have a future. In Singapore, on the other hand, what did the government do? It had a long-term vision under Lee Kuan Yew. And he said, the first thing you do is make sure people have, the point I made earlier, away from the drudgery of life, which is a shelter, which is decent and gives them dignity. And once you do that, then you can start shaping expectations. Then you create meritocracy. You create a competent government. You, you have complete uh, zero tolerance for corruption. And then the population can come with you with long-term visions. And so that's the same in China, actually, in many ways, but it's a, but it's a much bigger country. As Singapore would be a medium-sized city in China. Imagine the, the challenges of governing that. No, I fully appreciate that. Chandran, you talked about China, you talked about Singapore. In between our bunch of ASEAN countries stretching from Myanmar all the way to Vietnam, and then around us, we have Malaysia, Indonesia. Uh, how is South Asia and sustainability and the sort of thing that you're talking about, are they catching the zeitgeist of politics and social dialogue? Are we seeing some things to be hopeful about? You mean in Southeast Asia? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm always, I always, I never want to say I'm not hopeful. Uh, so I'd like to say I am uh, I want to be hopeful, but I do think policymakers in this region uh, have not uh, moved ahead of the curve. They're slow, partly because they're still stuck in this uh, neoliberal economic model way of thinking, uh, which is essentially 
uh, growth through extraction, uh, externalization of costs, et cetera, and not pricing it. The inability to think through monetary policy in different ways. And that's not their fault only because many of the elites were educated in that mainstream way of thinking, either in, either in the US, et cetera, and they came back with the same ideas. Um, and then the subservient nature of many of us who were colonized is to think of those ideas as the only one. So there hasn't been the new thinking yet. But on the positive side, I feel, and that's why, you know, uh, someone like me, someone like me continues to, to talk about this. And I am seeing policymakers beginning to listen. So I talked about the central bank in Malaysia thinking, how do we value natural capital? But we need a lot more people to talk about this. The problem is, and this is why I wrote these two books, uh, is that the depth of understanding of the interconnectedness is really not understood between the challenges we face, how we, how we organize our economies, and the consequences of mismanagement in terms of the implications for a large population, which Southeast Asia will, I think, peak at about a billion people. We have to move very quickly. And I, I can tell you that, you know, at least in Indonesia, there are one or two policymakers who are big fans of the sustainable state. Um, I'm working with policy, a couple of policymakers in Cambodia about these things. But in one of the most um, biologically diverse hotspots in the world, we cannot be slow. We are already uh, lost a lot. And I, I often use the haze as the best example of our mismanagement. And a lot, lot of people may not know, but the haze, and you know, there was a lot of coverage of the Australian fires, uh, I think 18 months ago. But the haze is the largest environmental catastrophe in the world. 20 years, more or less every other year, different, different intensity. And we in Southeast Asia have essentially not taken the best steps to to do something about it. I just made one point about Singapore. Five years ago, I was invited to address some Tomasic officials and other people about the haze. And I like to think I had a little impact, but I said it's not an environmental catastrophe. If the root cause is not poor people burning forests. The root cause is an economic model that underprices consumption because the palm oil essentially goes into the shampoo, the cheap food, all of that. And that's and and therefore shampoo today is almost you know so cheap. So it's our ability to con continue to create goods and services that are so underpriced. But the true cost, the asset base, is not priced into it, and therefore we continue to burn forests and things like that. So uh, I hope that uh, centers of learning, banks like DBS, who are talking about it, can disabuse people that you know we don't care. We have to care and we have to, and, and the, the other point I want to make is we can't just have middle class people talking about this and say, well, my children care. But I know the amount of times I meet people who say, oh, my children care. I say, who cares about that really? What we need to care about is policymakers at the highest levels in our government acting on these things with strong policies at the same time addressing the poverty alleviation issues, et cetera. That thinking is what I'm hoping that uh, will permeate far and deep into the region. And we must, we must act very quickly every day of the week. No, that, that urgency is uh, fully warranted. Uh, Chandran, I uh, look forward to your forthcoming articles and also wish you good luck in your third book. And uh, I hope that you know, your, your wise and insightful words, both spoken and written, find resonance or continue to find resonance far and wide. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you on Kopi Time, Chandran. Thank you so much. Thanks to our listeners, too. Kopi Time was produced by Martin Taki. Daisy Sharma and Violet Lee provided additional assistance. It is for information only and does not represent any trade recommendations. All 48 episodes of Kopi Time are available on YouTube and on all major podcast platforms, including Apple, Google, and Spotify. As for our research publications, webinars, and live streams, you can find them all by Googling DBS Research Library. Have a great day.